All right. Well, we are in this series, Ephesians, and uh, I'm, I, I, it's been a good series. Uh, for one thing, it, I get to know, I know what's coming next. Um, this is chapter two. Y'all know what's happening next week? That's good. Chapter three. Some of y'all been reading the Bible. Ephesians three comes after Ephesians two, and uh, so I'll be talking about that next week. But this week, I'm going to talk about Ephesians chapter two, and uh, it's a it's a such a powerful, powerful passage. Um, it, it really what this what this passage this whole book really does is tells us exactly who we are in Christ and why it's important that we trust and believe God even when it looks like the uh, it's not true even when it looks like the storms are going to win even when it looks like the the the, um, the situation isn't where where we where we thought it should be um, Ephesians chapter two is so good I'm going to actually read we only look at the first ten verses and so it's so good because. Um, it really shows us who God is, and it's kind of interesting because if you look at chapter um, chapter one, it actually ends uh, kind of actually on, on a really high note. It actually says in verse twenty three of Ephesians chapter one, it says, "And the church and his body it is made full and complete by Christ, who fills all things everywhere with Himself." And so then then it goes right into chapter two, which chapter two kind of starts off dark again. And so I think he's just reminding us where we once were and where God's calling us to. And so I'm just going to read this one and this, and then we're going to dig into the passage. And so it won't be on the screen or anything, but I want you guys just to listen to the, how powerful these, these verses are because it really shows us the power and the grace and the might of our God. Because, listen, we don't deserve heaven. There's nothing we can do. We don't deserve his grace. We don't deserve blessings. I don't care what the world says. You ain't good enough to receive God's blessings outside of the power and the blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that makes us worthy is his blood. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, the first 10 verses, and then we're going to dig into it this morning. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, this is the NLT version. It says, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. So at one point, you were just like the world obeying the devil. He is a spirit at, at, at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passion, desires, and the inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very own nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. And verse 4 is probably my favorite verse, but God. But God. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. And then verse 6, for he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as an example of those the incredible faith, the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown, in, as, as, shown as he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. You'll see that throughout the scripture, united with Christ Jesus. Look at verse nine. God saved you by his grace when you believed and you can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things that we have done. So no one can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you today for your word. God, thank you for the, the power in it. God, thank you for the truth in it. And God, I pray that this morning it would just pierce our hearts. God, you would, you would remove blinders from the minds of people. God, you would, you would pierce our hearts, remove any stronghold of, of anger, of bitterness, of control of religion this morning, that you would just remove those strongholds and, and let us receive your word today of grace and truth to change our lives forever. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, this morning I want to share with you this passage, and I found three things. I know that shocks you, but I found three things in this passage that, that really opened my eyes. Um, because I think I've been a Christian a long time, and, and I've heard people say, yeah, I've been a Christian my entire life. That's absolutely impossible. Uh, I'm going to show you why here in just a second. But I've been a Christian since I was 17 years old, been a Christ follower. And I'm going to tell you right now, sometimes I, I forget about the grace and the mercy of God. Sometimes I do. I just forget because God has blessed me so much and, and I haven't had to live that, that life of addiction to, to drugs and alcohol and in and out of jail and, 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 the, and the struggles and relationships. And I haven't had to live all that. And so I sometimes forget that it was God's grace that pulled me out of that, too. The good thing is I never had to go through it. He saved me from it, too. I just didn't have to go through it. Praise God. And so this, this passage really opened my eyes to help me understand the importance of really seeing God's grace and what it's about. So I want to show you this morning three things that God does, did and does for us that's going to hopefully help you understand where you are, uh, where you were, where you are, and also where he wants you to be. And so let's check this out. Look at verse 1. 
verse 1, Ephesians chapter 2. It says this, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, not some sins, not a few sins, not the sins that were bigger than others, not, not just the ones that, that made somebody mad, not the ones of just uh, of strongholds, not just the little bitty sins or the big old sins, many, many sins. And some, some pastors actually say trespass because of your disobedience and your trespasses. And so there's a difference between sin and trespass. When you sin, that's a sin, and you're not supposed to go back there, and then you trespass and keep doing it again and again. Um, and many, all of us have been here as, as kids. Uh, I remember we went camping one time. I was about eight years old, and my, my, my dad and my brother, older brother, had to go dump the trash. And so uh, they were, it was funny because that's when I found out that my dad could cook. And he told us not to tell anybody. And I remember him looking at me right in my retinas, and he said, don't you tell your mom I can cook. I just cooked a mean meal right there at the campfire. And then we were cleaning up, and he's sweeping. I ain't never seen my dad with a broom in his life, and he's sweeping the campsite. And I'm like, look at this dude. I'm, I'm, I'll never forget that. So him and my brother leave, and there's a sharp, there's a, like, a, like a Bowie knife sitting there on the, on the, on the picnic table. And, and he said, don't touch that knife. It's really sharp. Now, you shouldn't tell an eight-year-old that's about to be left alone, don't touch a knife. What do you think I did? I touched the knife. First, I just touched it. That was the sin. Nothing happened. <laughs> he didn't see me. There was no cameras back then. I didn't even know what a camera was. So we we're just like, okay, I, I can do this. I picked this knife up, y'all, and I don't even know how I did it. But the next thing I know, I had a gash all the way to my bone on my finger. I, I, I honestly don't know how I did it. I just, all I know is, I, and, and listen, y'all, I was, I was more worried about dad finding out than losing my finger. Why? Because he said, don't touch the knife. And when I touched it, it was a sin. And when I grabbed it, it was a trespass. And y'all, I split, I'm I still have a scar on my finger. And sometimes I look at it. Sometimes I just thank God for, uh, for his, his direction and his mercy and that my dad didn't kill me because I didn't tell my dad. We were about to leave the campsite and head home, and I just grabbed me a napkin as fast as I could. That thing was bleeding. You know, fingers bleed like crazy. And I just had that. The good thing it was my index finger, so I could just hold it like that and walk around. What's up? Fist, that, I made fist bumping popular before it was popular. I was fist bumping people. He never knew. I don't, I don't know. Maybe today he finds out that I cut my finger open with a knife he told me not to touch. Now, that was sin. Why? Because he's, he's not God. Well, he's my father, and I'm supposed to respect and honor him and listen to him and obey him, and I didn't do it. And he knew. Dad knew that if I got a hold of that knife, it was gonna, not going to end well. And thank goodness I didn't cut my entire finger off, and, and it just... It just healed up nice and clean without having to do anything. And thank goodness there was nothing got in there and got affected because I'd have lost my finger and never told him. I'd have been like, wait, what? What's that? <laughs> I woke up this morning, Mom. I don't know what happened. Y'all, y'all, I was eight, okay? So I know that you've been there. I know that, that somebody's told you something or, or your parents told you something or, or you, you've done something you weren't supposed to do and then you went back and did it again because we have disobedience. We were dead because of our disobedience, like dead, dead. Not just kind of dead. We were dead. You were dead in your trespasses and your sin. Look at verse 2. You used to live in truth just like the rest of the world. <clears throat> I'm sorry, you used to live in sin. Where did I get truth from? Hello. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. That, that's interesting because the world thinks that sin is truth. You know what people say? That's my truth. Um, your truth is going to send you straight to hell. That's what's going to happen. Your truth don't matter. His truth matters. Well, this is my truth. This is who I am. Now, the, you are who the Bible says you are. And the Bible says you used to live in sin. So you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil. In fact, the Bible says that we are the children of the devil. The commander of the powers of the unseen world or, or the commander of the, the air. He's the, he's the prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit at work of the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. He's at work in the hearts of those. Look at that. He's at the work of the hearts. Well, I have a pure heart. No, if you don't know Jesus, you don't have a good heart. Even if you do know Jesus, you still have flesh that's trying to pull you down. Listen, you have a past. There's sins that we live in. Listen, it was your past. You can't stay there. But the Bible says that because of that, because of that disobedience, we were dead. We were dead, dead. And then look at this. All of us, look at verse 3. All of us used to live that way. Not just some of us, not a few of us, all, and all means all. That, that's a powerful word, every single one. All of us used to live that way, following the passion, the desires, and inclinations of our sinful nature. That's why I said, I talk to people and say, yeah, I've been a Christian my whole life. <laughs> that's wrong. You can't be a Christian. Being an American doesn't make you a Christian. And they did. People think that because they have an American flag in their front yard, they know Jesus. No. You know how you know if you're a, a Christ follower? If you're following Christ, 
It's a dead giveaway. How you know somebody's a Christ follower if they're following Christ? Listen, all of us used to live this way. All of us used to be there. You, you, there was not point until there was a point in your life where you surrendered your life to Jesus. You're not a Christian. You're not following Jesus. You, there has to be a moment. That's why when you fill out a baptism form and you talk to us, we want to hear your story. What are we asking? Where's that moment? And, and I've had people tell me, I've been a Christian my whole life. No. The Bible says you were born in sin. All of us live that way. We have passion desires of our sinful nature. By our very own nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everybody else. Now, there's a passage in Romans 5, and so if you have your Bibles, you can flip there because we're going to kind of parallel these two because they're so important in Ephesians chapter 2 and Romans chapter 5. But in Romans chapter 5, uh, we're going to look at just about five verses from verses uh, 12 through 17. Here's what it says. We'll, we'll finish the rest of it in a minute. Let me just give you verse 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. Death spread to everyone for everyone had sinned. He says, so, so we have death. Adam's sin brought death. And so because Adam took the apple, he took the fruit from his wife Eve. She took the fruit and ate it and gave him some, and he took it and ate it. Now, it's funny that the Bible says it's not because of, it's not because of Eve's sin. Isn't that interesting? She was the first one to sin. It should have been on her. No. God gave Adam the word. He didn't give the word to Eve. He gave it to Adam. He was responsible. And because of Adam's sin, now sin was born into the entire world, and we've all sinned, and death came to the world. Not just some death, not a little bit dead. You weren't just kind of sort of dead. No, you were dead dead. You, you Dead dead. Now, your spirit was dead, dormant, like completely dead, no life, not like 10%, not we're going to put him on life support, he might be able to make it. No, dead dead. You had no hope. You had no hope before Jesus showed up. And if you haven't found Jesus, you still don't have any hope. He is hope. Listen, death came to every single person. You go, well, you know, I was a pretty good person before I found Jesus, not good enough to get to heaven. Because the Bible says, Jesus says, if you look at a woman with lustful eyes, you committed adultery. Listen, if you even hate somebody or get angry to somebody, you committed murder. What was he doing? He was changing the game. What was he saying? You're dead. It's on the inside, not what you did on the outside. If you had one bad thought about somebody, it's sin. It's sin, and so we can't make it right. Jesus had to come do that, but de we were dead, dead. Our spirit was dead, completely dead. In fact, I'm just saying it this way this morning. You just can't be mostly dead. Well, I, you know, there's a little glimmer of hope. No, you had no hope. That's what the world wants you to believe. Well, yeah, you just do a few good things. You'll be okay. No, it's not what the Bible says. Your truth don't matter. His truth will stand forever. You were dead, dead, not mostly dead, dead, dead. Reminds me of Boudreaux and Thibodeau. They went hunting one day, and Boudreaux just fell over, wasn't breathing, just, just fell over. So Thibodeau picked up the phone, called 911. He said, 911, what's your emergency? And Thibodeau said, Boudreaux, he's not breathing. He's just passed out on the ground. He's, not, he's gone. He said, what should I do? And the person on the phone said, 911. Agent said, well, first let's make sure he's dead. Well, there's a pause, and then you hear a gunshot. <laughs> then he said, what now? <laughs> yeah, you were Thibodeau dead. Like, you're Thibodeau dead. You're dead dead. Before you know Jesus, there's no life. Not in your spirit. Your spirit is dead. You'll see it all through Scripture. Dead, dead. Not mostly dead, not kind of dead. dead. No hope, dead. That's the first three verses. Ain't it good? So encouraging. Y'all, listen to the next verse. Probably my favorite verse in this whole passage. Look at verse 4. But God. You were dead, dead, but God. You were living in sin, but God. You had no hope, but God. You were, you were doomed for hell, but God. I love that. In fact, there's a series coming this fall called But God. You know how many passages say that? You know how many stories are in the Bible that says, But God stepped in? But God, I was, I was, there, there was this des, the, the destruction and desolation, but God. But God, who is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much. I love that passage, but God. You were dead, dead. Not mostly dead, not kind of dead, not had a little bit of hope, no hope, but God. But God, but God, but God, <clears throat> so rich in mercy. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 5. That even though we were dead, 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 
right? You're going to be saying that for the next 10 days, right? Just dead, dead. Somebody says dead, dead, dead. Like dead, dead. Not kind of dead, not sort of dead, not mostly dead, dead. Even though we were dead, no hope, lost forever, because of our sin, he gave us life. When he raised Christ from the dead, you can't miss this. It didn't just happen because he wanted it to happen. It happened because Jesus came down. He chose to come down, live 100% man, 100%, uh, 100% man, 100% God life, <clears throat> felt every bit of pain, and died for our sins. He was raised from the dead, and it's only by God's grace that you have been saved, only by God's grace. No other way. Can't earn it, can't live up to it, can't pay for it. Y'all, it's so incredible. He did this because he loves us. So here's the first thing I see in this passage that I just love, and that is this. God animates the spirit he placed in us. And that word, that word for that we were seated with Jesus, that we're seated with Christ, <clears throat> that word, that phrase actually means to animate. He actually took a dead object, it'd be like a puppet laying on the ground dead, and then you animate it. He animated our life. He animated our spirit. He brought life to our spirit. God animates the spirit he placed in us if we believe what Jesus did on the cross, that God, he died on the cross for our sins, and God raised him from the dead. If we will do those things, he will animate our spirit, and all of a sudden we have life and hope again. Uh, I want you to see this in the New King James, in the King James Version, same, same verse of Scripture, Ephesians 2, 5. It says, for even when you were dead in sins, hath he quickened us together with Christ. That word for quicken, <clears throat> it means to animate. It means to come to life. It means, to, it means to, to add life to. Again, it's just like a puppet. It's like bringing life to something. So he quickened us together. He animated us. He brought hope where there was no hope. He brought life where there was death. And he animated us. He animated our spirit. And he quickened us together with Christ. And by grace, and only by grace, are you saved. He animated our spirit. Listen, he brought, he just breathed life. I I love that when he made all the animals, he spoke them, right? He spoke the animals into existence. He spoke the trees and the water and, and the birds and everything. He spoke it to existence. But when he was ready for man, he breathed life into him. He formed him and he breathed life because that life was hope. He quickened us together. He brings life where there was death. He brings hope where there is no hope. Look at verse 6. It says, for he raised him from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him. That's that kind of same phrase. He seated us with him. He seated us together with him. He he quickened us. He brought us together with him in heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. You're going to see that throughout Ephesians and throughout the New Testament. He united us together with Christ Jesus. We are seated with the Savior right now. Do y'all know that? We are seated with him. We can't comprehend that. But y'all, you're seated now, but you're also seated in the heavenlies. That's what it means to be quickened. We're, We're seated with him in the heavenlies. He seated us with him. We're sitting beside him right now, spiritually speaking. But you're also sitting here. You're in two places at once. Wouldn't that be awesome if you could do that tomorrow? You could be home watching Netflix and be at work. <laughs> Maybe God will let you do it if you watch The Chosen. We'll see. Wouldn't it be awesome to be in two places at once? <clears throat> we are seated spiritually with him, but we're also here on earth. And that's important for us to understand. We are seated with him in the heavens. God animates our spirit. Here's the second thing that I love that he does in this passage is God celebrates the grace that he has on us. See, it was by his grace that you were saved. It was by his grace that you were animated. It's by his grace. Oh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> I knew somebody was going to hear that little tickle. The devil, that, so y'all remember last week that happened? I think it was last week. Second service, same spot, it happened again. That's right, Claire Bear. I call her Claire Bear. She's like my third daughter. Oh, I have water down here. <laughs> Some of y'all are just like, uh, dude, just look down. Y'all, God, God not only just has grace on us to animate our spirit, but then he celebrates that grace. He celebrates that grace. Celebrate God's grace. Hey, yeah, y'all listening. He celebrates, he has grace on us, and he just doesn't just blow it off like it's no big deal. God celebrates that. He celebrates that. I love that. Look at verse 7 in the same passage. Verse 7 of Ephesians 2. It says, so God can point to all future ages. He wants to point to all future ages of what, look at this, as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us, as shown in all he has done for us, who are, if we see it again, united with Christ. He points to all future generations, and he says, I want you to, not only am I going to do it for you, but I want to show, I want to show uh, future generations what happened here today. I love that. We prayed that prayer this morning in prayer. Was that, that was that God would use what happens here today, next week, next month, next decade of future generations to go, man, that was cornerstone stuff. 
That laid a foundation for revival to come to Calcutta Parish. He points to future generations. He does it so God, he does it so God can point to future ages as an example of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness. He, listen, he wants to point, do you, want, do you know that? He wants to point to 2035. Is that a thing? Yeah. 20, how do I think it's right? 2235. He wants to point to 2035 and go, look at what happened in 2024. It is 2024, right? Can't keep it straight, y'all. It's, you hit 46 or 47, it just, poof. she gone. But he wants to point to future generations and say, look at what happened. Look, 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 look at what I did. Look, look at what God did. Look what God did. Look at this grace. He points to future generations about his grace and kindness toward us as shown to all he's done for us who are united with Christ. He wants to point to future generations. I love this. Look at verse 8. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's a gift from God. God wants to celebrate the gift that he gave. I, I love giving gifts. It's one of my favorite things. And I love to give a gift. You know what I hate is when I give a gift and somebody's like, yeah, man, I appreciate it. And then they take it home and open it. Don't you hate that? Well, at least video it. Let me see a video of something. Y'all, he, it's a gift of grace. I, I love to give gifts. And then you stand back and you just watch. And then well, they open it up and it's like, yeah, I appreciate it. Anybody been there? You just want to slap them? Like, just give me that back. I'll take that back and get my $13 back. I have a, something in mind I was thinking about. Y'all, God's great. He gives grace. He gives grace, and he celebrates that grace. He wants to look to future generations. He wants to show future generations what he did. I love that. Go look at the Old Testament. See how many times he talks about past generations and future generations. He says, I'll pour my grace and love upon a thousand generations who love me. What's he doing? He's like, I want us to celebrate the grace that I have on people. He wants us to celebrate it just like he does, celebrate with him. He celebrates it. It's a gift from God. We can't earn it. Look at the next verse, verse 9. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so, so none of us can boast about it. Y'all, it's only God. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do for it. It's just all God. It is just him giving grace upon grace upon grace. And, and some of y'all are sitting here today and go, yeah, I just I, I ain't feeling it. I've done too many bad things. My, my family's not proud of me. I've let too many people down. I've gone down the wrong path. I've had too many addictions. I've been out of jail. I don't know what your past is, but I'm just going to tell you, God has grace on you. He has grace on you. One of my favorite stories is Andy Kate's story. And I tell his story more than he does probably, but I just, I love Andy's story, man. I love that he broke generational curses, and I got to stand in his backyard a couple weeks ago and watch his daughter marry a man that honors God. Because he married Christy and started honoring God together, and they have amazing kids, and God's doing some amazing things. He broke generational curses. Well, what happened? He didn't do anything for it. He didn't earn it. It's not a reward. But he said, he said you know what? God's going to have grace. I'm going to do something with it. What are you doing with God's grace? You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do for it. And the devil's got you convinced that, that God's not going to love you until you get some things straight. You can't serve in kids' church until you memorize 10 verses. It's 11, okay, not 10. <laughs> like you don't have to get to a certain level. You just need to say yes. I'm going to tell you, your yes will take you further than you know. It'll take you further than you can imagine because you just said yes. So he'll work out the rest of it. Just say yes, he'll do the rest. I mean, you got some work to do, but he wants to do the rest. And so here's a question that just kind of was in my spirit I wanted to ask you guys this morning because I think there are people here that just don't feel like God loves them. I'm going to tell you, there are moments in my life where I'm just like, I let you down again, Lord. I let you down again. I, I, I was supposed to do this, and I did that. I was supposed to be focused on that, and I focused on this. I was supposed to be happy today, and I'm angry because of a silly situation that has nothing to do with my entire life. It's just a one little moment, one little moment in time. And I just think sometimes, God, I don't, I, you, why do you love me? And so my question that I have for you today that I think is going to help us open our eyes today is that's simply this, because we think we have to earn it. When did God start loving you? When did God start loving you? Was it when you finally started going to church? No. Was it when you finally started going to life group because your sister bugged you for 16 months? No. Say thank you to that sister, by the way. She loves you. 
That's not when he started loving you. He just started loving you when you decided to open your Bible that you had to dust off because it's been hiding in the, in the, in the back closet for the last decade. That's not, listen, he loved you when he formed you in your mother's womb and beforehand. You can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to get it. And I want you to grasp that this morning. Grasp that thought that God loved you before you could ever do anything to earn his love. He loved you before you could ever do anything to earn his love. When did God start loving you? When did God start loving you? He's always loved you. And he's always loved you deeply and completely and with agape love. He sent his son to die for each one of you. Not some of you. He doesn't love more than he loves others. He doesn't love you more than he loves somebody else. He died for all of us. He sent his son to die for every single one of us. In fact, 1 John 4, 19 says we love, we are able to love because he first loved us. Love didn't exist before God existed. He created, he is love. The Bible says that God is love. And so you can't earn, there's nothing you can do to earn it. Listen, God celebrates that grace because it's just solely him. There's no, you don't have to earn it. There's nothing you can do for it. And, and I'm going to tell you, the world, world today doesn't, he doesn't, the world doesn't like that. The world doesn't understand that. We love him because he first loved us. We didn't have to earn it, do nothing about it. Well, let's get back to Romans chapter 5, verse 15. And, uh, and so we're going to read just a few verses here, but it just really gives us a good picture of where we were, where we are, and where we're going. Look at this. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. So God placed Adam in the garden. He said, don't eat the, the fruit. He ate the fruit. And that man, that moment, the Bible says, in that day, you'll surely die. Well, he didn't physically die that day, but spiritually he did. Spiritually, there was a death that was coming to all man because of one man's sin. Look at the next verse, part of this verse, ver part B of this verse. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this, this, other, the other, this other man, Jesus Christ. So he compares Adam to Jesus Christ. So he says, even greater is this God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness. Some of y'all talking about gifts from a while ago. Some of you need to give the gift of forgiveness today to somebody. Forgiveness is a gift. You need to give it away. Give it away. Give it away. I'm so grateful that people give me forgiveness because I need a lot of it. Give that, some of you have been holding on to that thing. I'll just, you just got to let it go. You have to let it go. Give that gift of forgiveness. It's important to do so. Look at the next verse. Verse 16, the first half says this. The result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of one man's sin. Look at the difference. He compares the difference between God's grace and Adam's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. Because what I'm not telling you is I'm not saying that you have to get rid of your sin in your life. I'm saying come as you are. I'm saying his grace is sufficient. Come as you are. Don't have to get your life cleaned up. You don't have to get things in order. Listen, when you come to Jesus, he will get those things in order. That's what grace does. That's what he does for us and through us. Even though we are guilty of many sins, he still loves us. Look at verse 17, the first half of 17. For the sin of one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many, but even greater is God's wonderful grace of his gift of righteousness. Here we see another gift, a gift of forgiveness and a gift of righteousness. How do you receive a gift? You just open your hand and take it. You ain't got to earn it. There's nothing you can do for it. It is a gift of righteousness. It's God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness to you and to me is so important. I love verse 17, the, the, the last half. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. All who receive that grace and receive that salvation will live in triumph over sin. Everybody that receives it will get that sin, receive that, that victory. It's so, 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 so powerful. God wants to celebrate his grace. I love Isaiah chapter 61, verses 8 and 9. It says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I love this. Watch this. And in my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make them an everlasting covenant with them. He says, I want to reward the people who are my people. He loves everybody, but he's going to reward those who are his people. Look at the next part of this verse, the next, the next verse, verse 9. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are, watch this, a people the Lord has blessed. Listen, God wants to celebrate his grace. He celebrates his grace on you. He celebrates his grace in you. He celebrates his grace through you. God wants to, he wants to look at future generations and say, look what I did. Look at, look at God. If you go back and read the Old Testament, you'll see there are many stories of people who forgot what God did. In fact, the Bible says the Israelites, uh, they forgot the miracles of God. And there was a leader who led a whole generation without remembering what God did for generations. 
I don't want to be that. I'm telling you, I love testimony videos. We're making some right now to show you guys what God did because I don't want to forget about the healings that happened in this place. I don't want to forget about the salvations that happened in this place. I don't want to forget about the families that have been restored in this place because of God's grace. We need to celebrate that. You are a people the Lord has blessed. I love that. Here's the third and last thing I want to share with you out of this passage this morning. That's this. God orchestrates the future he has for us. He orchestrates the future. He has a plan for your life. He didn't just save you from death and destruction for nothing. He didn't just save you so that you could just be, just a ho- have a ho-hum life and go, you know what, I'll just, I'll just be vanilla from here on out and I don't have to do anything. Y'all, he animates our spirit, he celebrates his grace, but then he orchestrates our future. I love that. He's got a plan for your life. He opens doors that no man can shut. And, and I'm going to tell you, I, I can just give you story after story after story of this being true. I have meaning to tell you now that I'll be telling you in the, in the near, very near future. But even when we moved into the shopping center, a couple of stories. One was we needed, we needed designated power just for the sound booth over there. And we're like, man, that's going to be expensive. We don't know anybody. I mean, my brother-in-law is really good, but he's really busy. Well, there was an oven in the kitchen, which was on the other side of the wall, that had its own power, and they took the oven out. We had our own dedicated power right there. Uh, there were doors in places that needed to be in places that we didn't have to spend a, money, a bunch of money to do to, to move around. Uh, there, was, there was power coming out of the floor. There's a concrete slab power coming out of the floor. And where we put the stage, it ended up coming right inside that, that stage. It doesn't mean a lot to you. But, but, but God said, I, when this building was built, I built it for this church in this moment. That's what he was telling me. Because I was like, God, is this you? Are you here? Is this what you want us to do? And then God has opened up doors that no man can shut. He has opened up doors that no man can shut. He has prepared and orchestrated your future. Look at verse 10. It's one of those powerful verses in this passage. For we are God's masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Watch this. Here's why. So that we can do the good things that he has planned for us. Not last week, not last month, a long time ago. God had your future planned out a long time ago. He has a future plan for you. He didn't just save you so you go sit on a, 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 like a not on the log and not do anything. No, he saved you for a purpose. When God sees you, he sees his son. Some of you are going, I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. No, but because of his blood, you are. He sees in you what you don't see in yourself. There was a sculptor who was a wood sculptor. He was, had this big log, and he was just chiseling away. And, and so he made some beautiful animals, and so he was working on this lion. And it was only about half done, and so there was still a lot of debris everywhere, and, and it didn't quite look like a lion yet. And A pedestrian walked up, and he started talking to, the, to this guy, this artist, and he said, I just got a question. He said, how do you make a lion out of a piece of wood? This big old block of wood. How do you make a lion out of this wood? And he said, it's simple. I just cut away everything that's not a lion. Let me just tell you, if you'll just turn yourself over to God, he'll cut away everything that's not a lion. He'll cut it loose. He'll cut it. You don't have to do it. He'll do it. You'll have to make some decisions, but he'll put it on your heart. You don't have to be perfect. Just show up. I'm telling you, you show up to the Lord and he will do some things in your life you could never imagine he could do. I was so introverted when, when I was younger. Danny Morgan talks about it all the time. I knew Danny in, in the 90s. And he said, Andy Thomas is a pastor? Because I was a dude in the corner not saying anything. Like, I didn't, uh, you know, I like people. I just liked them at a distance. You know what I'm saying? And I look back at all the jobs I've had and all the things that God did. He had a plan for me. I couldn't see it. Sometimes I didn't want to see it. But he had a plan. He was cutting away everything that wasn't lying. He did that in your life. God has a plan for your life. I love the, the book of Psalms, chapter 33. Look at this, 33, 11. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever and the purposes of his heart through all generations. The plans of the Lord stand firm forever. God has a plan for you. And the devil's beat you up. You're not good enough. You don't have it all together. You're a horrible parent. I don't care what the devil is telling you. Jesus is cutting away everything that's not a lion to turn you into something he can use for his kingdom. This passage reminded me of... Um, the word masterpiece, which actually is where we get our word poem, which is interesting. But it reminded me of this, this poem that, um, that my dad shared years and years ago, decades ago, in a sermon that he preached, and I've never forgotten it. It's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the old auctioneer thought it hardly worth a while." 
to waste his time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid, good people, he cried. Who starts the bidding for me? One dollar, one dollar, do I hear two? Two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going for three. But no, from a room in the far back, a great-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening up the strings, he played a melody pure and sweet, as sweet as the angels sing. The music ceased and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what now am I bid for this old violin? And he held it up with a bow. One thousand. One thousand, one thousand, do I hear two? Two thousand, who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, going for three, said he. The audience cheered, but some of them cried. We just don't understand. What change is worth? Swiftly came the reply. It was the touch of the master's hand. And many a man whose life's out of tune, all battered and bruised with hardship, is auctioned cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going, and almost gone. But the master comes. And the foolish crowd can never quite understand the worth of a soul, and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Maybe you feel like that old bow, that old violin, not worth $2, but you place yourself in the hands of the master, you're priceless. Surrender today. He wants to celebrate his grace. So he animates our spirit. He celebrates his grace. He wants to do that for you. He wants to do that for you. Will you let him? He has a future plan. He orchestrates your plans, a future plans. But you have to turn yourself over and put, them in, put yourself in his hand. I hope you do that today. Don't leave the same way you came. Submit yourself to him today and watch what he can do.